Shall we move on? Ornamental grasses. What I've done with this is uh, we have a lot of ornamental grasses, but they're really not, they don't have a lot of aesthetics. They're, they're nice. I'm not putting down our native grasses. <laughs> and a lot of people see the stuff like on the left, and they're thinking the great big huge purple plumes that stand 12 feet tall, and they don't grow here. They kind of do, but they don't really. And what happens more often than not is September rolls around, and it gets windy and wet, and they just, they fall over. There have been some years that we get um, the opportunity to have a uh, winter show. And that's what I like about the grasses, is they provide some really nice winter interest. And they get the really nice inflorescence on them, and they change colors and so forth. And on the right, you can see how they typically look in the summer. One thing I want to be real clear about grasses, they can be very invasive. I can't talk about this enough. So there's, here's three of the don't use, but I think everyone knows about these guys. Canary reed grass, DOT used that for revegetating slopes all over North America, and we're still paying dearly for it. Uh, striped giant reed grass and fox barley. You probably can't buy, well, you can buy the variegated uh, reed grass. You probably can't buy fox barley, but you could dig it up. And these are all stuff that's colonized, and it's all over the place. So one thing to be really careful is when you buy a grass, and I'm not saying that anybody here is, is not reputable, but, or if you're stealing something from a friend, do the research. If it self-seeds, you probably shouldn't buy it. We have a wonderful environment for propagating grasses. We have moist, wet soils. It doesn't get real hot, and that's really good for propagating seeds. The flip side is that you got to keep in mind is that a lot of these grasses also have stolons and rhizomes, and they will also create colonies. Uh, the reed grass the canary grass, that's how they reproduce. So even if they may have sterile seeds, you really got to look at how quickly they spread. So you got to be really careful with grasses. Birds get into them, they spread all over the place. So always a word of warning with the grasses. I've only got about six or eight grasses that I know will stay put. And like bamboo, you want clumpers, ones that clump. And if it's free, ask why. <laughs> I've got some Japanese knotweed for you, by the way, Ed. <laughs> Quarter mile of it in Thane. Help yourself. Uh, Golden Meadow Foxtail. This is a smaller one, uh, about 12 inches tall. It clumps. Uh, inflorescence. Inflorescence is the flower and seed head. Typically what will happen is most of these uh, will produce seed uh, or inflorescence probably mid to late summer. What happens often, because again, we don't get the degree heating days, the grasses don't get a chance to go all the way through and get through the whole cycle and create these beautiful feathery plumes. It starts to rain and they just kind of go flat. All grasses like really well-drained soils. Waterlogged soils are bad for grasses. Full sunlight, best for grasses. So don't try to sneak these guys into the shady corner of your lot. It's not going to work. They need as much sun and as much heat as possible and really well drained soils. Uh, this guy is a yellow green which is real nice. This is a cool season grass which means it comes on early, it'll flower early usually in May and June and come August it'll start to peter out. So cool season grass what you want to do is just after it flowers whack it down to about five inches and you'll stimulate a second uh, growth out of it. Um, again well drained loose soils with moisture for clumping Full sun, this one can tolerate a little bit of shade. What's nice about it is it does have a little bit of a yellow color. Carl Foles here, uh, I almost said canary, <laughs> feather reed grass. This is one that I've been using a fair bit. I've got Ed into it. He likes this one too. He's been using it up in Haines. Um, perhaps not as much success as Juno. Uh, what's nice about this one that I really like is it's got great kinetic aspects. It moves wonderfully in the wind. Just the lightest amount of wind and this thing's moving back and forth. It makes a really nice rustling noise. Um, it comes out, the inflorescence is, grows about 60 inches uh, tall. Not, that's not on top of the plant. Total height is about 60. It comes out kind of a purplish buff color, purplish yellow color. Um, and then it'll turn kind of a, a creamy brown color as the season progresses. Um, this one does withstand the rain fairly well because it's not real tall. The ones that are really tall, they get hammered by the wind and the rain. This one's really nice, tight, and compact. 
and it stays. You can see it's got some really nice clumping to it. Um, so I, this one I use a fair bit in terms of ornamental. And it's also the right scale. It's only going to get about this tall. So in my mind, well, once it flowers and everything, as the grass itself is about this tall, it doesn't need mowing. <laughs> That's the whole idea. I'm trying to give you low maintenance alternatives. It's not a bad idea that once autumn comes around and it really starts raining and windy, cut them down to about five inches. All ornamental grass is about five inches, cut them down. They're over at the transit center. I've, yeah, we've used them in a lot of different places. Uh, the one thing with this one is it doesn't have any autumn color. So it doesn't do anything super spanky cool in the autumn. Uh, this is a feather, a Korean feather reed grass. This one is a little bit smaller. It only gets about 36 inches tall, 24 to 36 inches tall. Uh, the inflorescence is only about 48 inches tall. Again, it's got a, what's nice is that it's got a more of a reddish purple when it comes out. Um, and it, this one actually has a little bit of autumn color to it. It turns a yellowish color. If it's an early rain, autumn, it's yellowy, brown, blacky. Um, this one's pretty adaptable, which is nice. A little bit better than the Carl Fosier in that it can deal with uh, more soil range. Again, full sun to partial shade. The more sun it gets, the more it's going to flower. Tufted hair grass. This is a native grass to southeast Alaska. Um, it's a nice clumper. It gets about 24 inches tall. There's a whole bunch of cultivars to this. There's probably at least a dozen or so. Some have yellow inflorescences. Some has kind of green. Some has a yellow color. Um, what's nice about this is this is all over southeast Alaska. You usually find it just outside of the beach fringes and in meadows. Um, it does seed readily, but that's okay because it's a native. So I'm cool with that. So if you don't mind something that's going to be a ornamental grass that's going to spread throughout your property, this is already native, so I, that's why I'm, I'm saying this one's cool. Um, deer like it, geese like it, so it's good forage plant material if you want to get some wildlife in there. Um, doesn't do really do much in autumn, and it falls pretty flat come autumn. It pretty much lays down. Um, it can deal with pretty much all soils, including waterlogged soils, um, and it can deal with full sun to full shade. Really, uh, really diverse plant in terms of cultural requirements. Here's another native, wild ryegrass. This one you see along the beach fringes. This needs really sandy soils. It's tolerant of, of salt, but it's got the really nice blue-green foliage, and it gets the really, really nice seed heads on it. Again, this is one that will spread. It's got really aggressive rhizomes, and it'll form a huge colony, which can be good. Um, really easy to dig up. You can just dig a couple. They pull right out of the sand with the littlest of uh, effort. Um, they grow about, they range anywhere from 12 to 48 inches tall, depending on how much organics are in the soil. As the soils get wo uh, wetter, they get shorter in size. If they're really well drained, they get taller. Um, yeah, the spiked inflorescence is really kind of cool on these guys. And as I said, they, they're, they're pretty bomber proof too, but they need well drained. You can't plant them in organic soils. You can't plant them in native soils. It's sandy soils only for these guys. Blue fescue, this is probably the ornamental grass everybody knows. Cute little guys, six to ten inches tall, little spiky pin cushions. Uh, they've got the bright blue leaves. Dozens and dozens of varieties, ones that grow from two inches high to 18 inches high, flower at different times. Some are spikier, some are round, some are clump forming. Uh, they need well-drained soils and full sun to partial shade. Uh, Again, the only thing to keep in mind with these is that it does have a little bit of uh, inflorescence on it, but uh, it doesn't last very long. You're really planting this guy for the blue foliage. Here's one we're playing with, and this much like um, our, uh, our previous one we were talking about is this one. Um, this one is invasive in, southeast, in, south, in the southern states, I should say. We haven't seen it really being invasive in southeast, Use this with caution, but it's ultra cool in terms of aesthetics. Um, this is Japanese bloodgrass. It gets about 12 to 18 inches tall. It's a very slow spreader from what we've seen here. Um, it doesn't really get any flowers on it, but it has red tips on the green blades. One thing you have to keep in mind, it needs well-drained soils. It needs to be kept moist at all times. But the tricky part is it really hates wet soils in the winter. And from what I've been finding, that's what's really been knocking this thing down. So if you can get a really well-drained soil, because right now what's happening outside is what this plant hates. So 
keep that in mind. So plant, and I wouldn't plant a lot of this, but it's a really neat ornamental grass that you might want to use. Um, again, the more sun, the better, but it can handle a little bit of shade. Yep. We can say that about all the plants. I, I, will it happen in five years, ten years? Will the fact that we're always wet keep it under control? The question was, is, is climate change going to make this an invasive in southeast Alaska? Sure. Yeah. Yeah, again, that's why I'm saying this is one to use with caution. But aesthetically, it's really cool. It doesn't spread by seed, so that's, that's good. It doesn't really produce seed. So if you're really worried about it, get an old bucket plant it in that and bury it in your, to keep it from spreading. I have a lot of this in the Portland area of Idaho where it gets a lot of rain. It's not like we do here. So when it has a tendency to um, get a lot of rain, it kind of dies down. And then when it goes away, it comes back. I mean, it looks like you've lost it and then it'll come back. So I think it's probably the same thing that happens here. Sure. So the comment was in Idaho when it rains a lot, this plant's starts to go a little bit dormant, and when it dries out, it pops back up. As I said, that's, why, that's the real killer for this plant in the winter, is when we get these really wet periods. So, Again, in terms of grasses, the cool things that you want to use with grasses is you want to plant, because they're clumping, they're really aesthetic, they've got a really nice form unto themselves. So much like ferns, you plant them in a horizontal ground plane of something, and you put three or four of them together, just to provide a little accent. Or you can just go for a huge mega stand. They also work really nice tucking one or two, especially some of the taller ones, into uh, shrub beds. I'm not a big fan of tucking the ferns into shrub beds just because of how they are, but because these have a really nice vertical line to them coming up, they really make a nice strong accent in the shrub border. So you could use a couple of them. Usually plant a couple in clumps here and there within your shrub border, or if you've got a big horizontal plane of some sort of low ground cover, maybe it's even some of the low ferns, a couple of these popping out really look nice. Another one is Autumn Flame, Miscanthus. This one gets about 36 inches high. It's a clumper. Um, we're finding this one also does fairly well, but it's, it's, we're kind of on the, the cusp of its survivability. I think the same thing with the Japanese bloodgrass. It doesn't like the wet autumns, cold, wet winters. It would prefer it gets cold, freezes, and locks up and stays in that state. It really doesn't like... It's true for all grasses. They don't like going back and forth. They would prefer it to be minus 20 degrees in that soil to be frozen solid for five months rather than this kind of 32, 36, 28 degree stuff. So that can be a limiting one on this one. The nice thing about this one is that it has really nice red-orange autumn color. It's one of the few ornamental grasses that has a nice autumn color. Um, so it changes from kind of a, a deep green to a reddish orange. And again, if we, got a, if we have an early autumn and it starts raining a lot, the stuff kind of goes, kind of goes flat. Uh, Again, more sun, the better. Um, it, this is one of the ones that actually gets kind of a feathery plume to it. And it gets about 48 to about four to five feet tall. And it's got a purple pink tinge to it, so it is nice. So this is one that actually gets kind of the, the romantic ornamental grass feathery plume. Any questions on ornamental grasses in the back? Well, if it's wild rye, it's going to come back pretty quickly. Um, it depends on what material, what they put back in as infill. It's been a couple of years in some spots, and it hasn't come back. I, it's hard to say without looking at the soil and the conditions, but I would try to match whatever was existing in terms of what your existing landscape was, or was there, and try to recreate that and bring it back. You know, oftentimes, you'll have a few inches of organics, and that stuff always gets scraped off. So it... It's a hard to answer, but I'd say the easiest thing to do is put what's adjacent, but try to match with the existing uh, environment which was there before they came and ripped it out. I got another half hour to go, right? No. Mosses. Mosses are ultra cool. We fight them all the time. We don't like them in our grass. We don't like them on our roof. We don't like them on our brick pavers. I love mosses. Why fight them? That's my philosophy. We're not sitting outside in our Speedos and our two-piece bikinis in the sun. We're not. Let's face it. Those days you need to pull out the chair. 
I'm a big fan of mosses. I'm using them more and more in my landscapes. They can be high maintenance though. If you want a really cool moss lawn, it's, it's a lot of work. But once they become established, they will keep other stuff out. They do fairly well. Everybody knows this. Everybody has this. Spear moss. A nodity. It doesn't grow in the wild, but it grows in your grass, in your front yard. So for whatever reason, it is native to southeast Alaska. It's fairly uncommon in the wilds, but it's in your turf somewhere. Um, grows one to two inches. You know what it is. It's kind of yellowy and green and shiny, and you fight it out and over and over, and you're always fighting this battle. Um, give up the grass. Let it go. Broom moss. This is, a, this is a real nice one. With all these mosses, these are ones that are going to form really dense um, thickets. They're going to be really big, thick mats. With all these mosses, what you can do, you can grind them up with buttermilk if you want to. You can also just take small little plants and plant them, and they will spread amazingly quick. One thing I want to do with the mosses is show that some need rocky soils, some need organic soils, some want it so that you've got a range. So if you want a moss, there's a moss in this presentation that you can plant somewhere on, on your yard. Um, but as I said, you can dig them up, you can buy them in pots from nurseries, um, but they're really easy to transplant, and all you really want to do is transplant them basically from August to September when we've got a lot of moisture. May, June, July, when it's really dry, that's not when you want to transplant them. Um, I make Ed do it because that's when he works, but generally you want to do them in the, aut in the autumn when there's a lot of moisture, unless you're going to give them the irrigation. This one's really nice because it's tight. It's got a really nice fine texture. Uh, this one is generally found on trees and logs. Uh, it needs high organic soils. And if, what you can actually do is if you can cut out a square. And you just pull it right up. It comes right off and you just transplant it. Try to find similar soil conditions. Find the moss that matches yours. I'm not saying go out into the forest and take up crates and crates of this stuff. It does spread fairly quickly if you can give it the right, uh, the right sun and soil. Yellow moss. This is one that gets about four to six inches tall. It's really shiny. The one reason I put this one is because it's got a golden color. It really forms extensive mats. This, this stuff will really take over nicely. Again, it's found at the base of trees and logs, but it also grows on boulders. So it's really diverse. So if you've got some rocks and you want to create a really nice carpet, this is one that you might want to consider. Um, it does best on moist soils, but it will also grow on rocks as long as you're giving it moisture the first couple of years. And it can handle full to partial shade. With any moss, that you plant, you're really going to need the moisture on it for about two months for it to become established. Gray hair cap moss, another south, these are all southeast Alaska mosses. These are all in the woods behind our houses right now. This is a nice one. I really like kind of the world uh, formation of the, of the, of the bracts. Uh, one to two inches high, they've also formed dense mats. Uh, you can see the, uh, the uh, fruiting body on the top of them that kind of create these nice little yellow golden. Um, caps on the end of them, hence the gray hair cap. Uh, what's nice about it is it does have kind of have a, a grayish white color to it, so it adds a little bit of sparkle to it. Uh, this one is also very diverse in that it does not grow on organic soils, but it grows on gravels and on slopes, uh, rocky slopes and cliffs and boulders. Full sun to part shade. This is its Brother, this is the common hair cap moss, and this is the one that grows on organic soils. So you can see two very similar plants. One grows on rocks, one grows on organic soils. Uh, this one grows about four to six inches tall, and again, moist soils, partial to full shade. Odd hair cap moss, similar to the other one, except for it's got, uh, when the Sporophytes come up, it's got red stalks, which create a nice little bit of contrast to them. It's got a deep green, again, the world texture to it, about one to two, or two to three inches tall. Um, this one can handle drier soils, and it's also found on boulders and rocks and so forth. Um, gravelly, acidic soils, boulders, and dry environments. So again, don't plant this one into your peat bog. You won't be happy there. This one needs sun, though, so full sun. Generally, if it grows on gravelly soils or boulders, it wants full sun or as much sun as you can give it. Uh, small flat moss, this is one that's absolutely everywhere out there in the woods. Uh, this one grows on trees and logs, exposed soils, high organic soils, one to two inches high, and it cre creates kind of this waterfall creeping 
matte. It's really kind of nice, really nice fine texture. It's a yellowish green color. Uh, it's one that I really like to use. And uh, again, full to partial shade and compacted soils to organic soils. Yeah, the nice thing is this one will grow in really compacted, poor soils, as long as there's moisture. Don't fertilize it, don't cut it, no. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, just, just, yeah, spray it with a herbicide and just kill the grass. It's that simple. And you might want to be a little selective. The, the spear moss that's in your grass is probably the least aesthetic of all the mosses. Um, but I'm just letting you know you've already got it there. Yep? I'll get to that in a minute. Here's another one that's absolutely everywhere. This is rock moss or roadside rock moss. It gets about one to three inches tall. Any place that's got exposed rocks, sides of highways, this stuff is everywhere. It's on rocks, it's on roots. Um, it's the one that's often on the roof of your cabin. This one's everywhere as long as it's got full sun and exposure. Uh, it's really happy, but it does need the full sun. And as I said, any rocky, soil, uh, rocky gravelly soils is where you'll find this fella. And it's really nice in that it forms a seriously dense mat. Take a look at anybody who's got a cabin somewhere. That's what your roof is probably covered in. Lanky moss, I like this one. This is also a very, another, very common one. This is more for organic soils, and this stuff can form a serious ground cover. It gets about four to six inches tall. Um, it's kind of got this really loose texture to it, but there's so, so many branches that just forms this really what appears to be a thick moss, but it's just got so much branching to it. Uh, it's yellowish green to dark green, so it's kind of variable in its color. But in my mind, it's kind of got a really nice tidy look to it. I, I, I just like the consistency and the texture to this one. It's not all kind of, well, they call it lanky. I don't call it lanky. I like it. Um, but anyway, it's very common on moist, acidic, organic soils, partial shade to full sun. Use as a moss in the landscape. Native landscape. Create a naturalized landscape. This is so pleasing to the eye. There's no chaos. You've got very simple, if you've been to any of the, the talks that we've done for Master Gardeners or the, the Landscape Architect Gardening Workshop that we've done, we talk about simplicity in your garden design. Smooth texture, horizontal, strong vertical coming out with the trees. This is so peaceful. Japanese have been doing this forever. We can do this too. It really, our climate is so perfect for growing mosses and primroses. <laughs> and you can put the two together. Ed and I can come together on this one, I think. But in my mind, combining mosses with rocks and a creek and a couple of ferns for accent, you can't go wrong. It is maintenance, though. They don't like high traffic. They don't like a lot of wear and tear. They don't like your dog pooping and peeing on them. So you've got to keep that in mind. Great, you've got some ugly shot rock somewhere on your property because you've got some fill. Cover it with moss. So that's what I highly recommend is I think that mosses in the landscape is just so pleasing, so easy, spread so quickly. It's inexpensive, and anyone can do it. <laughs> Fun with mosses. It grows everywhere. It absolutely does. There you've got your roadside moss, which grows on the roof of your cabin, covering a VW bug. You've got some moss graffiti on a piece of plywood. Okay, how do you do it, you ask? Let's have some fun with moss. Here's the recipe. Moss spray paint. What happens with moss is it's actually the green parts are not the parts that are reproducing when you th throw them together. It's the dormant pieces. What happens, there's dormant pieces of a moss that just kind of hang out. And when all of a sudden the plant gets stressed, they kick into action and they actually become the re reproduction or the revegetative part of mosses. You don't have to run it through your blender. You can, an easy way, if you've got a lawnmower with a side bag attachment, hit that. You have a whole bunch of moss cuttings in your bag. You can just rip it up with your hands. You don't have, it doesn't have to be a tiny shred. If you want to do some moss spray paint, shredded moss, Container of yogurt or buttermilk, a little bit of sugar, shake it all up, and you paint it on. Or you use muslin, the, the muslin, the cloth. You just lay it over, and you soak it in this stuff, and you lay it over the rocks. It'll look a little goofy for a little while, but it takes over very quickly, and then the muslin just, just 
deteriorates, biodegrades, and you're good to go. So you can do some really fun things. If you want to do fun stuff like this, though, don't do it May, June, and July. You want to do it, or sorry, do it in May, June, and July, because otherwise the rains are going to come if you want to do cool graffiti, and it's going to wash it off the wall. You're doing this when it's dry, but that means you're going out there every day and you're misting it. So if you want to be a green graffiti artist, I've had fun with this. A couple of reference books that I use. These are three of my favorites. Gardening with Grasses. Encyclopedia of Grasses and Livable Landscapes. And there's really only one book on moss gardening that's, in my opinion, any good. Uh, these are books that I have by the side of my desk that I use all the time. Any question? Oh, question in the back. Any particular moss makes the best for hanging baskets? That's sphagnum usually. Well, not for to be dead, but to be alive. Like, just turn it inside out? Yeah, you could. The, the, the only issue is the moisture. Hanging baskets... When you've got sphagnum, the idea is that the sphagnum is main to, as dead sphagnum, it's holding the moisture for the plants in the hanging basket. To flip it around, turn it inside out, and also to be growing moss at the same time, it's a, you can do it. It's a lot more maintenance in terms of watering. Um, it happens naturally sometime if you leave your baskets out too long. Um, anyone have experience on that? You have your baskets in the shade, that, and you know, hang it underneath the shade trees yeah. and stuff where it's hard to grow any flowers. Yeah, like the, the, the shady side of my hanging peat pots that I use for my tomatoes, always covered in moss on the north side, always. Any other questions? Yes. I have Call Ed Byerski. Call your friends. Yeah, I. That's. I think you just send an email out to the master gardeners and say, "Hey, we're having a fern digging party. These are the species I've got. Come and get them. Saturday, ten to twelve." And you go to town, you serve tea and cookies, and people dig up, and you leave a coffee can there, and they're throwing fives in it for you. <laughs> That's what I would do. <laughs> Any other questions? The name of the author on Moss Garden, I can't read it. George Shen, S-C-H-E, oh, Schenk, sorry, S-C-H-E-N-K. It's the only book really out there on Moss Gardening. You Google Moss Gardening, it's really the only book that comes up. But it's a really well-written book. This is me. Need to get a hold of me. I'm happy to answer questions. Um, yeah? Can you make your PowerPoint available so they can post it on the website? All the can out there, you can throw a fiver in it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that shouldn't be a problem. Okay. Thanks for coming out.